I V M. You've tuned into a show called Mr and Mrs Binge Watch and you were expecting a spoiler free episode so there are many many spoilers on this episode kripya dhyan dijiye Hello and welcome you've tuned into a brand new episode of Mr and Mrs Binge Watch I'm Janis Sequera and I am Mr Janis Sequera <laughs> You know these jokes about this is getting bad. We we just never know how to open the show, you guys. Anyway, today Guha and I are going to be talking about Narcos Mexico season two. Yes, for all those of you who've been wondering how long Narcos has been going on, well, we've also been wondering the same thing. I also don't know whether it is season two or season five. It is like so. No, 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 no. Like it's like Mexico season two, but Narcos season five. So Narcos original, which they should have actually now in hindsight called Narcos Colombia, uh, had three seasons. Okay, because there were two seasons dedicated to Pablo. Escobar and there was one season dedicated to the Cali cartel. Correct. And then they did a spin-off Narcos Mexico, Correct. which now they're in their second season. So you're right, technically they should actually be Narcos season 5, but apparently audiences were getting confused. I don't know. Why, why did they decide Narcos, to call it Mexico? No, but what Narcos has done is something so unique and something no other show has ever done is that it's a spin-off. Ha. Huh. But it's also a new season altogether. Also what is interesting about it is the fact that they've gone back in time so what has happened is that another way to tell the story would have been what is happening in Colombia and what is happening in Mexico could have been told simultaneously i'm mm. saying as a narrative choice they had you know there was an option but they essentially stuck to the entire colombia story in the first 3 seasons got done with that at that point of time i'm not really sure if they knew what they are going to do with the mexico strand of it but i'm assuming that in the process of doing research and if you remember even when we were watching narcos there were a lot of references to mexico yeah there were references to characters in the mexico show which we are only sort of watching now yeah uh, and it's the same thing with narcos mexico because with the timelines having gone back so for example narcos began in the 70s and sort of ended in the mid 90s around 92 93 i think was when pablo was uh, assassinated so that was the end of season 2 and then maybe a couple more years of uh, you know the story staying in colombia with mexico they've gone back to the early 80s so mm. it's interesting it's like the same timeline playing out from two different angles i i also think maybe that's why they decided to call it narcos mexico because with the timelines going back and forth where at with cali cartel you'd sort of ended up much later and now you were going back to mexico which was happening in the 80s viewers might have found it a little confusing to figure out what was happening simultaneously in both countries when and why Yeah in a sense if you've never watched Narcos and then you're just an idiot <laughs> and gotten into Narcos Mexico directly no, no. it's still a brand new show no i'm saying that they've they've the way they've they've structured it is that if you've never watched Narcos which like i said is foolish but you just say for example put netflix on one day and you see two seasons of Narcos Mexico and decided to watch it it's still fine because it's not like The story is that connected to Narcos in in any way whatsoever. Actually, so I'm curious. Now I'm saying that now because of our algorithm, you and I will never be able to tell what Netflix is recommending to us first. For example, for a brand no, new they, user who who they don't know who their choices, what their choices are like, are they recommending Narcos Mexico first because that in the timeline happens first, or are they recommending Narcos uh, Escobar? <laughs> I'm just like renaming the show. I know what yeah. you're saying. I know what you're saying. That's an interesting. But I'm assuming. I mean, uh, I think what they do is that they obviously put out the trending shows on top. So I'm assuming anyone who's a new user will want to go back and watch. uh earlier seasons of any show whatsoever by the way i just wanted to quickly i mean now that you talked about trending uh, shows this is a new thing that netflix has started worldwide huh where now every time i seem to click on a show or actually we seem to click on a show it says trending at number 9 yeah, trending yeah. at in number india, 8 in india in india so there it's it's very smart i feel because yeah. what was happening was that you were feeling so disconnected huh. from all the stuff that was being put out on netflix and ever since netflix was launched they don't do trps they don't give out numbers of you know viewers per 
episode per show they give some very random data at the end of the year which nobody can understand like a lot of it is based on who was the first one and a half minute of something which is ridiculous because especially you and me how often have we started watching a show huh. and then gotten bored midway through the pilot and stopped watching it and also let's be honest that could very well i mean i'm not accusing netflix of anything but i'm saying all these otts refuse to give out their own data which means that they could be fudging their own numbers right i don't think it's they're like, fudging it it's like times now republic saying that we are number one but data kaha it's hai, about no correct so it's not about fudging it i think it's about using selective data to your own advantage correct like between the age group of 16 to 20 we are number 1 Dude, but I'll between the you, age group of 16 to 20s and then in this market this region this area yeah so when i was working at dna and when the quarterly results used to be out now, are you going to going to throw now, them now times of india used to be like this everybody was reading times of india right it was like a david versus goliath situation where hindustan times and dna were like were like small fry in comparison mm. but we would still find a way to be number 1 in some <laughs> market so uh, so the day after the reports would come out times of india would do this half page anchor on the front page saying we are first year we are first year we are first year hindustan times would do a small little piece saying we are first in like you were saying earlier in the 13 to 14 and a half age group <laughs> in five cities and dna would also be number 1 in something or the other like o- among business readers for example one minute silence for the fact that dna newspaper does no longer exist yeah well are you kidding place, we can't really give it one minute guys i mean too much air time going waste the place where there. i started my career does not exist neither does time out wow is it me <laughs> i don't know but uh, well print is dying so i i won't uh, it's not really uh, actually even uh, even i mean honest news in general is dying not like i'm saying time out or dna were like uh, flag bearers of oh my god we only report honest truth but i'm just saying in general please contribute to great websites which are reporting real news uh, like on, the wire and scroll, scroll and yeah. all news yes please go go contribute just to let them. our political leanings be known but we are digressing a bit no, now I mean, coming back to the trending list on netflix yeah. i think it's going to become interesting now because you know as indians you want to know what indians are watching at least if you're not getting the global perspective at least if you're not getting to know what is really doing well you know it's going to become a barometer now the downside to it is that every time a new indian original launches It's going to be in the top ten for the first few days, yeah. and then producers are going to start like you know. I was just you know, going to say you know, this. You know, producers के साथ अभी ये डील होगी. You know how producers? Will you put our show at number one no, for no, like ten no. weeks? No, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, for example, how now they put out like four and a half stars from some website called Bollywood Bubble, for example. Oh, or, that's a real website. Or, yeah, yeah. I am taking real website. I'm saying these. Websites that give four five stars, they basically they turn an entire ad out of it. Now it'll be like trending at number two on Netflix. <laughs> Now this movie called The Body, which released in December <laughs> and bombed at the box office, was trending at number two because it's a new film and Indian audiences are bound to check out a new Indian film. But it's not really any. It doesn't reflect on whether they are really enjoying the film or not, right? Or how it's doing. I mean, imagine if the week that Drive, which was the Dharma film that never made it to theaters and went straight to Netflix, if that was trending at number one, how many more people would have been conned into watching that shit But film? But it would have. But see, what's going to happen in the long run? I hope it's going to be fun. It's like how you do a top ten list, top ten bestseller list. How many weeks was a book on the New York Times bestseller list? So, for example, if a book. Was in the top ten list for fifty three weeks, as opposed to another one that was there for say fourteen weeks, mm. or like how you did the Billboard US and UK countdown. It's a bit like that. I think in the long run, what's going to happen is that if you consistently see an Indian original staying in the top ten, you know that that's being watched. So I'm assuming that if this feature had come out when Sacred Game season one had come out, it would have stayed in the top ten for a long time. Yeah, the only problem here is that all our other top ten lists across from what if you, whether you're talking about who's big on which platform, or you're talking about which books are selling, or you're talking about which movies are great in a particular year, are all somewhere connected to audience rating and actual footfalls in theaters, right? Yeah. The only problem here is that these OTTs are ain't telling us what their real data is. So honestly, I'm a very like non. So I don't know if this top ten is the number of people watching or just a trending list. It's the same uh, logic, right? I think But it's just curiosity list. No, I think na. it's number of people watching because Friends is in the top ten list constantly, and I've been noticing that for the last one since they've launched it, it's moving between six and ten. That's 10. also Netflix just showing off that saying "fuck off." No one else has Friends; only we have Friends. Uh, well, why would they just put it in the top ten? Anyway, now we are talking like yeah, having these hypothetical we're discussions as if Narcos, we know guys. how the top ten works. But yeah, coming back to Narcos, so Narcos basically came out with 
Narcos Mexico came out with a second season last month and to be really honest I thought that it was like a good idea being done for way too long also I had my reservations about season 1 which was basically so if Narcos was about Pablo Escobar and the Cali cartel and the entire Colombian sort of drug mafia Narcos Mexico was season 1 was basically about two major characters one was Diego Luna playing uh, Miguel Angel Felix Galardo and Michael Peña playing a DEA agent called Kiki Camarena now Kiki Camarena for those like me who after watching a show like Narcos which is based on real incidents love to go back and read up on history hmm. was this legendary DA officer whose death in Mexico basically threw everything out of gear and just made like DA agents take note of Mexico and everything just went nuts now the entire season 1 was a long setup to the event of Camarena's eventual death mm. what essentially happened was that Kiki Camarena was picked up by the Mexican drug lords he was tortured for many days and he was then eventually killed and his body disposed of and that basically set a chain reaction in place now if that is the first episode of any new show it's fucking amazing right because then you're totally into it and you want to know what's going to happen from there on what narcos mexico did which was because they were rebooting the entire show was that they spent a lot of time mm. in building you know felix galardo's character in building kiki camarena's character in to building give you the plazas around the there. plazas and giving you a sense of what the mexico drug Landscape. cartel was uh, was entirely about so while i felt like it was a little bit it was more of the same what has happened is that this season which i was not really looking forward to and i really really enjoyed was that it got to benefit from all the hard work that had been put into season 1 yeah and the thing is that i mean at the end of the day i agree with you i feel like diego luna who plays felix galardo is a very boring character right yeah. i mean he is not you know pablo escobar had this certain like he was unpredictable he was violent he was ruthless and yet he was a loving family man diego luna I mean um you know rather Felix Galardo is a very boring character on paper. Yeah. What I like though is the way season 2 starts because you know I feel like shows that generally have to do with law enforcement and drugs you're constantly reminded about how much America gives a f- about each one of its citizens mm. and especially those in law enforcement mm-hmm. i mean even through pablo escobar both the seasons of uh, narco season 1 and 2 you're constantly remind that pablo may cross any line but killing an american is an absolute no no Yeah, yeah. Right. So then, for Pablo Escobar and his team, never cross that line. They yeah. will not f- with America. Yeah. But Felix Galardo dared to f- with America in a yeah, sense, right? Yeah. By killing an American law enforcement officer. Also, also, and it, the way they start season two is to almost say, "You f- you, you f- with us now. See what we can do." Wow, you're going to be beeped a lot in this episode. I know. I'm just. But like, however, I'm, I'm going, looking going around and saying, to, "Shit, I should not have said f- so many times." Oh, there, I said it again. So in the earlier Narcos, what was also so interesting about it was that. the protagonists were never as interesting as the antagonist yeah. right so boyd holbrook played this really in- increasingly like it cre- I, I, you know i cringe every horrible. time no also boyd holbrook was the guy narrating the story and i hated his voice over <laughs> uh, you know the way he he narrated the story it really you know got to me and pedro pascal played by uh, javier peña kind of grew into his own only by the third season it was no, after no. peña was he, amazing no but peña came to the forefront in season 3 right they did away with boyd holbrook Thank he God. came to the forefront and the kali cartel took over and that was interesting what i didn't like about season 1 of this show was that a you are right felix was never going to be as interesting an antagonist as either the kali cartel boys or as pablo but what i liked was that camerina played by michael pinya was a damn good character and then when they killed him off i was like now what am i even watching the show for so what they've done right in season 2 is a they have really built on the entire events of season 1 hmm. for anybody who's watched narcos mexico or you know is contemplating whether season 2 lives up to the earlier seasons it really does i mean i really enjoyed it either was a very smartly made season one very interesting thing that happens is that coming back to what you said earlier that for the first time in narcos you see 
very proactive American characters. Yeah. So in the earlier seasons, your American characters were just reacting to what was happening in Colombia or Mexico. Mm. This is the first time where your character of Walt Breslin, which has been played by Scoot McNary, because of the fact that Camarena was tortured and killed, Murdered, yeah. has now entered Mexico with a singular mission with like a small team of ragtag, uh, you know, American and Mexican uh, uh, police officers to basically hunt down all the people who were responsible for Kiki Cameron's death. And that is such an interesting layer. You know, while watching, I kept telling you this. It just reminded me of, say, what Steven Spielberg did with Munich, mm. which was also about this group of, you know, Jewish people entering, uh, you know, avenging uh, what happened at the Olympics. So I like that aspect of righteous vengeance which has been layered into this new season because in addition to all the usual drug mafia aspects that this season also has, it has this running layer of Americans, you know, hitting back, good guys rather hitting back at the bad guys, which I found really fascinating and interesting. The other thing that I liked about this season is that, you know, um, the narco season 2 mexico um uses a lot of the same tropes that maybe season 1 and season 2 were Correct. featuring pablo escobar yeah, used yeah. right so felix galardo will use his connections and money and the cocaine business to run politics in the country yeah. he uses that you know his entire connection and disconnection with his family and partners yeah. then also the interesting thing is that finally felix galardo also rises to the challenge of how far will power go to sort of change the status quo, right? How far will you go to maintain the fact that you are the biggest dick yeah. in, in a group of dicks, Yeah. right? Another thing I liked about season two Mexico is the fact that they finally also shown us the lengths to which Felix Gallardo, who, I mean, like I said, like you and I were discussing earlier, in season one is a pretty dull character, right? He's almost like a de facto leader because no one else will take leadership. Mm-hmm. But in this season, you've actually shown that the lengths he will go to to retain his power. Mm-hmm. So there are a couple of really gruesome scenes and really gruesome decisions that he takes. He also uses a lot of the same tropes that maybe Pablo Escobar uses I mean, hello, rigging an election. Yeah, That was yeah. so sort of reminiscent of what Pablo Escobar did during his own sort of reign. But which was your standout scene or a wow moment that sort of really left you shook? Yeah, before I do the wow moment too, I just want to add to what you were saying. This entire gangster gaining power and rising in influence and then having a downfall is the most classic gangster trope ever. You've seen it in Scarface. You've seen it in Godfather. You saw it with Pablo in season one. So by that logic, if you think about it, Felix Galado's fall from power in season two of of Narcos Mexico is the most cliched and predictable thing. However, they've still managed to make it interesting with some really fine writing and some really smart decisions that they've made. I also think what has really worked for the season this year is the fact that they have not they've tried to make it more of an ensemble piece. So they've worked on other characters, whether it's the character of Amado, you know, who's been around for like, since the very beginning, actually, he was also in the original Narcos. Mm. Or the character of Acosta, who was introduced last season, but was, I mean, not really a character that we were taken in by, but whose arc has been really nicely developed this season. So I feel like all these various pieces, whether it's the Breslin character, Acosta, Amado, between all of them, the Felix arc also works. And there's also the rivalry feel, between the plazas. The rivalry between the plazas. Because they're already sort of telling us that, hey, Narcos isn't going away anytime soon. Yeah. We will do season 3 also. Yeah. Until you tell us that we are done with this show. No, not they will just keep that. Going. I think what is interesting also about the fact that now that the timelines are converging, you know, if you remember, Narcos season 3 ended with Javier Pena's character basically being asked, after the entire Colombian cartels have been uh, taken care of, what is the next step? And he says the next step is Mexico. And then you go back in time and do two seasons of Mexico. I'm just wondering if if Javier Pena has been saying that boss, we are season four mein wale hai. <laughs> because imagine it's almost going to be like a crossover, almost like an Avengers thing, where if they basically converge with that timeline, you know, mm. at the end of say the next season or even season four. And then you come back to that point where Narcos had ended and then you have the, you know, Pedro Pascal's character actually entering Mexico and 
teaming up with say a world wrestler i mean that would be amazing right so guys plus 10 for anyone who understood anirudh's explanation right now i mean like send us a comment yeah, about that fan, because if you can't see my face right now i just have a blank expression where okay, i'm so nodding i'll do it all over no, again no 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 i don't want this all over again but look, you can explain to me fan, right home this is a fan theory i have a feeling what's going to happen is that narcos mexico and narcos timelines are going to converge write a book and then we are going to get a common season write for a tweet. for both shows write uh, an essay going back to the the earlier question that you had about my wow moment of the show there's one really like i said munich type uh, you know action set piece where these american officers basically stage a plot to uh, abduct this very high ranking security guy yeah. uh, in the mexican government and they managed to do that and then there is this whole torture sequence that they put him through hmm. now this is interesting because we saw him as the guy torturing kiki camerena in the last season correct and this is like payback but it does not play out like a regular event scene at all because they are not able to crack him at all and the reason they are not able to crack him and you realize the power of a gangster is when he turns around and tells him that there is a difference between you and me the reason i was able to do what i did to kiki camerena is because i'm not thinking right i mean you guys come with no i have no loyalty i have no family no, no loyalty one. no family and it's like that's what makes a person so much more dangerous right that at the end of the day law enforcement officers still need to work within a certain boundary and i thought that that scene was really a wow moment for me So moving on to the scene stealer of the week for me the scene stealer of Narcos Mexico is very very clearly Scoot McNary playing Walt Breslin because uh you know what i was saying earlier about Boyd Holbrook's voice over was that in the first season of Narcos Mexico there was a voice over and you never introduced that character and you didn't know who the character was till the end of the season when they actually introduced Scoot McNary and Scoot McNary is such an ideal guy to do any kind of storytelling or voice over because he's got this amazingly drawling cool voice <laughs> which he also brings to his personality what i also like about this season is that they've used the voice over very sparingly so mm. they haven't really spoon fed audiences by repeatedly stopping to explain history or any of that uh, but i also feel that scoot mcnary just got a certain energy to the show that was missing it's almost like he's infused it with some fresh spirit and of course he's a great actor but uh, but i really also liked what he did with the world breston character it just makes me want to look forward to what the character does next season and hence look forward to the next season mine is gerardo tarasena who plays pablo acosta who is of course one of the drug lords working uh, who's one of the main drug lords in the juarez plaza he wants to give up the business he wants to get out he has this american texan girlfriend gringo as they refer to her constantly in the show and he's just looking for a way out but is sticking around because his partner the crow wants him to stay to stick around right but towards the end of the season you know there's this entire episode where he has basically gone and hidden in this entire village that he commands yeah. that runs according to his whims and wishes and he's basically ready for anything that happens whether it's the mexican law enforcement officers coming to To get him, whether it's the FBI or whether it's Felix's men, and he gets one of the most beautiful send-offs on the show. I mean, his death sequence, especially minutes after he's found out that his girlfriend is pregnant. Great, and yeah. the way Scoot McNary goes in there and says, "Listen, just stand behind me, and they won't shoot you." And then he says, "Initially, you feel like this character is actually going to survive the season." But those and are the best. And then he pushes Scoot McNary and says, "Listen." forgive me i'm sorry yeah i think the best moments are those where you are not sure what's going to happen to a character and it's unpredictable and that's what happened to him on the show as well and i also feel that they really spent time in building acosta's character so like i said in the last season i didn't think of him as being a, a major player but i loved the way they built his arc this season so yeah he was excellent as well but all said and done i think that if you know narcos mexico i am surprised to say this because i thought that you know i was quite certain because some of the greatest shows we know you know are bound to you know give away or slip at some point and i felt that this would be that season but it wasn't i think they really put together a great show extremely watchable and also i mean i feel that narcos is now no more about great storytelling or characters i just feel that all of us are so seduced by that world Mm. uh you know of the latin speaking men and those you know that topography and just the entire world 
uh, is just so interesting. You just gotten so used to it that uh, that you know you look forward to an Arcos season. It just helps that it was also actually really good. So what this has done is that uh, it. It's made me really look forward to season three, and now I'm also looking forward to see if my theory works out, which you didn't understand, but I'm sure at least one listener has uh, has pieced together. In terms of our binge meter, I think uh, Narcos Mexico season two is like a good plate of dal khichdi. It's comfort khana, but with a little sprinkle of potato chips on the side because even though you know what to expect, there's always a little sharp crunch. That was Janice and me talking about Narcos season two, uh, Mexico season two. All five to whatever you want to call it seasons are out on Netflix. So go binge, go crazy, and don't do coke, guys. Not cool. <laughs> and if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcast dot com. You can also follow us on our social media handles. We are at IVM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, if you want to reach out to Guha or me, reach us on Twitter at Janice Kedi Five at Ani Guha or Instagram same handles. See you next week, guys. I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week: HDFC Life and Paytm Money. Also, just a very quick note: I would really appreciate it if you guys could fill out a really short survey on our website. It's on ivmpodcast.com/survey. It's just a brand recognition survey for us to kind of work with the advertisers and give them some data. So it's a very short, less than one minute survey. Really appreciate your help in filling it out. And let me tell you a couple of things that you should check out this week. On paperback, the host of Edges and Sledges, Dhananjay Chak, gets in a conversation with Satyajit and Racheta about his podcast, cricketers, and stories that have stayed with him. On football football, Karthik Sivram and Gaurav talk about Liverpool's losing to Atletico and give their predictions for the second leg of the Champions League. On Golgappa, Tripti is joined by Lakshmi, host of Lit Nama. They talk about literature, books, and more. On Edges and Sledges, DJ Ashwin and Varun talk about India's great run at the T20 Women's World Cup and the New Zealand versus India Test. On Ganatantra, Sadhu and Alok are joined by Rahul Verma of the Center for Policy Research. They discuss how Indian voters vote along the lines of ideology and identity. Thanks and keep listening. Remember the last vacation you took? What about the one you took three years ago? Okay, how much do you really remember? It's a question I've asked myself often over a decade of traveling the world. Hey, I'm Utsav and I do not travel the world for a living. I have a full-time job and responsibilities, but I have made traveling the world a priority. Priority enough that I negotiate extra leave in my job contracts, obsessively track my frequent flyer miles, and I'm willing to take off at the sight of a cheap ticket. Yes, I am cheap. I have lived and worked in 3 countries. I understand human behavior for a living and these experiences have given me unique insights into places, people and culture. With over a decade of travel behind me, I increasingly realized one thing that we cannot see everything. So whatever we see, we must see deeply. Because as the film of memory decays, the imprints which will stand the test of time are the ones felt by the immersion of the senses, not by fleeting encounters with them. Postcards from Nowhere is an immersion into the world of slow travel, one story at a time. Tune in every Thursday on the IVM Podcast app, website, or wherever you get your podcast from.